and welcome to the 2021 Fields Medal Symposium in honor of Peter Schulze. I'm Jared Weinstein, professor of mathematics at Boston University, and it is my great pleasure and honor to be giving this introduction to Schulze's work. So who is Peter Schulze, and what are his contributions to mathematics? Schulze was born in Dresden in 1987 and grew up in Berlin. Early on, he displayed an extraordinary talent in mathematics by winning three gold medals and one silver medal at the International Mathematics Olympiad, a contest for high school students featuring fiendishly difficult problems. Schulze attended the University of Bonn and completed his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in the space of five years. His doctoral advisor was Michael Rappaport, whose advisor in turn was Pierre Deligne, winner of the 1978 Fields Medal. Schulze's dissertation at Bonn settled a problem posed by Deligne decades earlier. This dissertation, which carried the title Perfectoid Spaces, was an instant sensation. Now, we'll get to what perfectoid spaces actually are in a moment, but suffice it to say, the appearance of the idea was a tectonic shift for the field. In universities and institutions throughout the world, professors and students gathered in seminars for a few hours a week just to discuss the ideas of this 22-year-old from Bonn. There were international conferences, special semesters, graduate student workshops, and all manner of publications devoted to the topic of perfectoid spaces. Anyone researching in the field of arithmetic geometry quickly realized that Schultz's dissertation on perfectoid spaces was required reading. In 2011, Schultze himself came to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, to give lectures and meet the researchers who were working there. I was fortunate enough to be one of those researchers, and Schultze's visit led to a collaboration which, frankly, changed the course of my career. In the decade that followed, Schultze would go on to collaborate with many mathematicians and produce articles and books totaling thousands of pages. He would also go on to win many awards, including the Cole Prize, the Fermat Prize, and the Leibniz Prize. As you know by now, Schultz's Fields Medal was awarded in 2018, but already in 2014, there were whispers that a medal was coming his way. Since he was so young, it was just a question of which year it was going to be. So, what exactly did Schultz accomplish, and why did it electrify so many people? To answer this, I must explain what it is that research mathematicians do. Many people are surprised to learn that mathematical research is a thing, because the math they learned in school was presented as static or already solved. But it's quite the opposite. Mathematicians will never run out of things to do because there are plenty of unsolved mathematical problems, and mathematicians come up with more every passing year. Problems in math are considered solved when a mathematician produces a formal proof, just like you might have done in grade school plain geometry. The result of solving a mathematical problem this way is called a theorem. But far from being an exercise in drudgery, a proof for a theorem can be considered elegant or even beautiful by mathematicians if it produces a maximally powerful result with a maximally simple or short, sequence of steps. To write elegant proofs, you need elegant definitions. For a mathematician, a definition is not quite like what you see in a dictionary. Rather, coming up with a definition is like writing down the rules for a new game. For instance, the axioms you use in those plain geometry proofs can be seen as a definition of the Euclidean plane. Their elegance and economy are the reason they've endured for 2,000 years. We also have a definition of the basic concept of number, as well as the concept of set. In the 20th century, geometers wanted to study some more complicated shapes than the plane, like this donut-shaped object or this shape. 
Alexander Grotendieck, who won the Fields Medal in 1966, gave us the definition of a scheme, a marvelous abstraction tying together all shapes that can be described using algebraic equations. Grotendieck's concept of a scheme was essential to all kinds of breakthroughs, from Pierre de Ligne's proof of the Vey conjectures to Andrew Wiles's proof of Fermat's last theorem. To these definitions, we now add Schultz's perfectoid spaces, as well as other exotic novelties, such as the diamond and the condensed set. Schultze and his collaborators wrote down definitions, proved the basic theorem surrounding them, and then they and other mathematicians used those definitions to solve all sorts of problems. Somehow a dam had burst. The enormous opportunities to solve new problems meant that everyone working in the field of arithmetic geometry was now obligated to learn all things Schultzian. So, what makes a definition useful in solving problems? Brevity and simplicity are key. Schultze himself says that when he works on mathematics, he prefers to work without writing anything down. That means that he must formulate his ideas in the cleanest way possible. As he puts it, You only have some kind of limited capacity in your head, so you can't do too complicated things. I'd like to take this idea further and offer an analogy. A spider's brain may be too limited to grasp the large-scale structure of its web. It certainly does not have the coordinates of where each thread is to be placed, but it can still spin the web by executing a simple set of rules. In this analogy, the spider is the mathematician, the simple set of rules is the elegant definition, and the web is the complex mathematical object brought into existence by that definition. So, coming up with the right definitions, the right rules of the game, is much of the battle in math. Simple rules can produce complex and useful results. Once you have the right definitions, even the most difficult theorems seem to prove themselves. I haven't said anything yet about the actual content of Schultz's work. Now, Schultz's work spans quite a few topics throughout mathematics, but there's a common element to much of what he does, p-adic numbers and p-adic geometry. Let's talk about numbers for a moment. Everyone starts counting with what we call the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. We learn methods for adding and multiplying natural numbers. Then we learn about representing numbers in between the natural numbers using decimals, and we learn how to add and multiply those as well. At some point, we learn about numbers like pi, whose decimal representation doesn't end, but nonetheless, our rules for adding and multiplying extend to these as well. The numbers you can write down with decimals, infinite or not, are called real numbers, so-called because they can represent quantities in the real world. How many kilograms is Mount Everest? Or how many meters from here to the moon? The answers are real numbers. So we have here a decent definition, the rules of the game, for real numbers. Actually, there's one more rule we mustn't forget. 0.9 repeating equals 1. And more generally, a tail of repeating 9s can be rounded up. Now. You may have found this rule strange when you first encountered it, and you might have even resisted it a little bit. If so, you might be stumbling upon some Schultzian ideas. Imagine a number system without the rule of repeating nines, in which point nine repeating really is less than one. It seems simpler that way. But this number system has some, let's say, continuity problems. If Zeno of Alea wants to move one meter forward, he will first have to move nine-tenths of the way, and then nine-tenths of the remaining distance, and so on. But without the rule of repeating nines, Zeno never makes it. Dropping the rule of repeated nines seems to exclude the possibility of continuous motion. 
what's left of the real numbers resembles nothing so much as a disconnected cloud of dust. When we reimpose the rule, the cloud of dust condenses back into the real number line. This is, in fact, the idea behind condensed sets, a deep new idea developed by Schultze and Dustin Clausen. The idea is that almost any shape can be thought of as a cloud of dust, together with a rule that tells you how to glue the dust back together. Anyway, after settling on the rules of the real number game, we can start talking about geometry. Arrange all the real numbers in a row, and you get a line. Add another dimension to create the plane, where each point represents a pair of real numbers called coordinates. An algebraic equation relating those coordinates determines a curve. The interplay between equations like this and the shapes they represent is called algebraic geometry. An algebraic geometer might look at an equation like this and say, of course, that's a hyperelliptic curve of genus 2, and its solutions look like a donut with two holes. So far, so good. Let's revisit the rules that govern real numbers. The digits are permitted to go off to the right without end, but what if we tweak the game a different way so that the digits are now permitted to go off to the left instead? The usual rules for addition and multiplication still apply. These new numbers don't quantify anything in the real world. But as mathematicians, we come up with definitions, the rules of the game, and then stand back and see what happens. What we have defined in this game are known as the 10 attic numbers, an entirely different number system from the reals. There are some similarities. In the real numbers, fractions like one-third have repeating decimals. And in the 10 attic numbers, they have repeating decimals as well. In the real numbers, we impose the rule that 0.9 repeating equals 1. In the 10 attic numbers, there's a corresponding rule where repeating 9s give you negative 1. And finally, in the real numbers, irrational numbers like the square root of 41 have non-repeating decimals. The same is true for the 10 attic numbers. We have described the 10 attic numbers here, but by working with a base other than 10, you can define the p attic numbers for any base p. For reasons I won't get into, mathematicians usually only allow p to be a prime number. And in case you were wondering, the idea behind the name is to extend the pattern dyadic for 2, triadic for 3, etc. Now, the p-adic numbers are nothing new. They were first described by Kurt Hensel in 1897. So what did Peter Schultze and his collaborators do with them? The answer has to do with the kind of geometry you get when you replace the real numbers with the p-adic numbers. What happens to the familiar real number line? Well, various attempts have been made to visualize the p-adic numbers, and all of them seem to have a self-similar or fractal nature. But none of them is perfect. Our little spider brains can't quite fully grasp the p-adic number line the same way we can grasp the real one. As an example of how mind-bending p-adic geometry is, consider the following two facts. Every triangle is isosceles, and every point within a circle is the center of that circle. Very strange. Another nice thing about real geometry is that no matter how complicated a shape may be, if you take a magnifying glass and zoom in on any particular spot, the shape becomes rather simpler. You could then figure out a lot about the shape by describing how these pieces fit together. But in p-adic geometry, applying a magnifying glass to a shape doesn't seem to make it any simpler. The fractal doesn't become any less of a fractal when you zoom in on it. In the 20th century, brilliant luminaries made huge strides in this field. 
but it was Schulze who came up with the incredible idea of just using a better magnifying glass. Schulze discovered that when you zoom in ever closer on a piatic shape, a new sort of entity appears, and that's what a perfectoid space is. It's a little like the discovery of a new elementary particle, smaller than the atomic nucleus. Now that we know about perfectoid spaces and how they fit together, we can gain all kinds of new insights into p-adic geometry. Schultz's latest work, in collaboration with Laurent Fargue, is a 350-page treatise entitled Geometrization of the Local Langlands Correspondence. It came out just a few months ago, and my colleagues and I have been feverishly studying it. This new work strikes a dagger into the heart of something called the Langlands Program, which is sometimes described as a grand unified theory of math, bringing together so many different objects in math into perfect harmony. Naturally, intimate knowledge of perfectoid spaces is a prerequisite. At this point, you might be asking, this all sounds fascinating, clearly a lot of people are interested in it, but what is the real use of p-adic geometry? Does it have any practical applications? Now, as a mathematician, I am obligated to remind you that basically all the technology and science that makes society function rests at least partially on mathematics. But between you and me, when someone like Peter Schulze discovers new math, he's not thinking about applications or even anything related to the physical world. Instead, he's peering into a universe all its own. What others might describe as invention or creating, he might describe simply as learning. Learning about structures and patterns that are already there. As Schultz puts it, For me, doing research is really like discovering certain things that are just out there. The sense of discovering something that's there completely independently of the world. It's a unique sensation. Mathematicians may disagree on whether math is created or discovered, but they all agree that learning, writing, discussing mathematics brings a powerful sense of satisfaction and joy. A large part of this joy is sharing it with a community of like-minded souls. I myself am immensely grateful to have Peter Schulze in our community of mathematicians, and I hope you'll join me in congratulating him on winning the Fields Medal. Thank you.